A 10 port switch costing a grand? Yep, and it should sound great too. Hard to understand though, especially for those that think that if normal network gear functions well for the tax authorities, then why not for audio? That question has been asked a lot, and my answer is always the same. Tax authorities have all the time in the world as where digital audio is extremely time critical. Far more even than we thought 10 years ago. And might you wonder, buffering apparently can't take away all the time inconsistencies. I've read a lot about things that might cause timing problems like logic introduced modulation, but I have no way of measuring it. But luckily I have a well trained auditory system. Most houses nowadays are connected to the internet. This can be done over a telephone line, over a cable system or over glass fiber. In your home these end up in a box that is usually called a router. In most cases it's more than just a router, it's a modem, a router and often also a switch and a Wi-Fi access point. The modem translates the signals from your provider into signals used by the Ethernet, your home network. The router does the administration for your home network, like handing out IP addresses to all devices in your network. If your router also has more local area network sockets, it also has a so called switch inside. A switch in its basic form is just a distribution socket that lets you connect more than one network device to your router. Nowadays switches are smart in that they route signals only to the port the address computer is connected to. And the Wi-Fi access point essentially is the radio that connects the network to your Wi-Fi devices. If you then know that these routers are built very cheap, you might understand why timing accuracy isn't too high standards. Keep in mind that digital signals are in fact analog square waves that will get distorted by default. Important is the degree of distortion. Watch my video Connecting your DAC number 2, how digital can go wrong. To keep the terminology simple, I will refer to the modem router switch as router, meaning the box your internet provider uses to connect to your home network. Using this switch is just as easy as using a mains distribution socket. Just plug in the power adapter and the network cables and it works. The SOTM switch also is connected to the router by network cable. From the SOTM switch another network cable is then connected to your AV receiver, network audio player or network bridge, whatever you use to play music from the network over. Since the SOTM switch has more than one network socket, you can also connect other network equipment to it, like a game console, smart TV, Blu-ray player and so on. Sending data over network nowadays is extremely robust, in that no bits are lost. If bits don't arrive, it will be noted and data will be sent again until the receiving device informs the sending device that the packet of data has been received error free. During the transport of digital audio, there might not be the time to resend the data and even if there is, the receiving circuit needs to get the data in the right order and send it to the reconstruction filter in an extremely precise pace. As said before, this appears to be quite difficult given the femtosecond precision you need for serious audio quality. Nowadays I am convinced that the importance of the Ethernet receiver circuit is as important perhaps sometimes even more important than the quality of the digital to analog conversion circuit. The same goes for other digital inputs like USB, AES, EBU and SPDIF. It pays therefore to have both the network circuits and the circuits that send the digital audio to the DAC very low on jitter. For then there is less need for heavy femtosecond precision time based correction. The SNH10G on review here 
shares the exterior design of the other products of the SOTM Advanced 2 line, like the SMS200 and SMS200 Ultra network bridges and the SPS500 power supply. But at 296 mm it's a lot wider. The depth is 211 mm and the height 50 mm. The front holds a power LED and 10 pairs of signal LEDs, each pair indicating the presence of a connection and network traffic. The rear holds the power switch that has three positions, on with signaling LEDs on the front switched on, off and on with signaling LEDs switched off. Next to it the 9V DC input to connect the supplied switch mode World War II. Then eight 8P8C sockets, often called RJ45 or Ethernet port, and two SFP ports that can be used for glass fiber connections. More about that later on. Devices in this category need to be reviewed in my setup 1 and there the SOTM switch replaced the AccuFox AccuSwitch SE which is 100 euros lower in price. Differences between the two are truly marginal and after a lot of listening I do prefer the SOTM but again the differences are tiny, very tiny. It's the transients that are just a bit better. Time to replace the switch mode wallboard with the S-Booster BOTW PMP Eco MK2 power supply. That appeared to be no success. Just as with the AccuFox, the supplied power supply was a better choice. Before I go on, let me stress again that both the AccuFox and the SOTM perform so much better than the cheap switches for the consumer market. And then there are the two small form factor pluggable transceiver ports, SFP for short. This is a modular system that facilitates interfacing with all kinds of network standards, but is currently mainly used for fiber optics interfacing. A small interface module is plugged into the SFP port and ends in two so called LC sockets. These accept fiber optic cables ending in LC connectors. The module has an input and an output, so paired glass fiber cables must be used, connected in crosslink. The SOTM supports the IEEE 802.3AB 1000 base T Ethernet norm and the IEEE 802.3X flow control, but the SFP hardware is not officially standardized but specified in a so called multi source agreement among competing manufacturers. The transceiver I use is a Finisar 1000 base SX and 2G optical transceiver on both ends of the glass fiber cable and a simple EL029 medial converter that connects to the fiber interface on one side and the 8P8C Ethernet connector on the other side. That is connected to the standard D-Link switch in the studio on the third floor where the server and the storage is housed. From there runs a 15 meters, almost 50 feet, glass fiber to the ground floor where setup 1 and thus the SOTM switch is located. The glass fiber cable ran parallel to the CAT6A cable, so comparison was a matter of unplugging one and plugging in the other and back. Not that there was so much to expect according to some. Any network cable will run 15 meters length without any problem according to the specifications used in a network market. Normal CAT6A twisted pair network cable already should run 100 meters effortless. But the SX fiber optics I used here can run up to 550 meters. This means that per meter the losses will be lower than with CAT6A. This leads to a cleaner square wave. Again, see my video connecting your DAC number 2, how digital can go wrong. Furthermore, fiber optic cable is not sensitive to electromagnetic fields and offer full galvanic separation, eliminating other possible distortion of the square waves. Listening to fiber might be the wrong header. Better would have been the influence of CAT6A for apparently the influence of the CAT6A on the sound is rather clear. Fiber is superior on transients, precision, spaciousness and black background. And I'm talking about the analog sound, not the network signal. Overall it offers a more relaxed sound. 
the difference was so clear that I immediately replaced the CAT6 A for fiber. That might all be due to local conditions. For instance, the main digital radio and TV transmitter that has the antenna mounted in a 300 meters, 1000 feet high telecommunications tower is at only 5 kilometers, 3 miles distance. Unfortunately, I don't have the resources to investigate this further. But then again, two SFP media converters, one transceiver and 50 meters of fiber cable will cost slightly over 100 euros. The fiber cable costing the least at 15 euros for 15 meters. There might also be quality difference between brands and types of media converters, but again, I currently lack the resources to research that further. The SNH 10G audiophile router clearly delivers on the promise of sound improvement. Using UTP network cable like CAT5 or 6, it is only very slightly better than my AccuFox AccuSwitch SE. And believe me, both provide shockingly better sound quality than the standard consumer switches from D-Link, Netgear, TP-Link and others. In my case, the long distance, well, 15 meters, between the stereo and the Rune Rock server was handled a lot better by fiber optics than by CAT6A network cables. Since the SOTM switch does have two SFP ports, it does facilitate the SFP media converters needed for optics. I will, over time, dive deeper into the fiber optics and when I think something is worth reporting, you will see it in a new video. And next week, a set of wireless Dynaudio speakers will be featured in yet another video. So if you don't want to miss that, subscribe to this channel or follow me on the social media so you know when the new videos are out. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Many thanks to all that support this channel financially. It keeps me independent and thus trustworthy. If you also feel like supporting my work, the links are in the comments below this video on YouTube. I'm Hans Beekhuizen, thank you for watching and see you in the next show or on the hbproject.com. Whatever you do, enjoy the music. <laughs>